Okay, so welcome everyone to this population uh, dynamic seminar of this Friday. Uh, today we have uh, Martina Dal Bello. First of all, I will introduce the speaker. I hope you can see my screen with the slide. Okay. So Martina comes from uh, MIT and will uh, shift to Yale very soon. She has a new lab there. Today she will talk about the distribution of fast and slow growing bacteria changes predictability with seawater temperature and salinity. Couple of uh, lines regarding Martina. So she did a PhD and postdoc in uh, Pisa, Italy, in biology. Then uh, postdoc and researcher uh, uh, position at uh, MIT in the physics department. And uh, final assistant professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Yale University, where she is opening the lab. She is interested in microbial community ecology and understanding how the environment actually shape the structure of the communities. She does it uh, with uh, experimental and also some uh, uh, theoretical uh, tools uh, by assembling artificial uh, communities taken from natural habitats and try to connect metabol metabolism and uh, relevant uh, community properties. Uh, she's also interested in nutrient mediated interaction and community diversity and she has also some uh, uh, work uh, or project in ecological uh, how ecological drivers uh, uh, are distributed and uh, um, especially she's interested in fast and slow growers so probably today we will uh, learn something about this uh, this part and finally she has also some work in membrane community response to environmental perturbation so with this one, I would like to give the stage to Martina and stop sharing my screen. You can actually share yours if I can stop sharing mine. Yeah, so please, Martina, go on. The stage is yours. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction and also for having me here today. I'm really excited about uh, uh, speaking at this seminar series. And so, yes, as, um, as uh, we heard from the introduction, uh, today's work uh, is going to be about uh, uh, slow and, uh, and fast growers bacteria and how, and how uh, changes in the environment promote either uh, slow or fast growers. So yeah, first I just want to start with just remind us why we are interested in, uh, in bacterial communities. Well, today I'm gonna talk about oceans and so I decided to tell you a bit more about why microbes are so important for the oceans. So microbes in the ocean recycle organic matter and uh, in this way they provide uh, nutrients to primary producers and also in this way they contribute to the long-term storage of carbon. And together with phytoplankton, uh, bacteria uh, actually are responsible for producing half of the oxygen that we breathe. And also they regulate the production of important greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So, but I would say one question that is, is really important in trying to understand how communities form and how communities respond to changes in the environment is, how can we coarse grain these communities? Or in other words, what are the relevant um, traits that we should study to understand how community works, or in my case, how a community respond to change, responds to changes in the environment? So if we go to uh, the ecological literature, I think that what we will find is that the concept of fast versus slow grow, growth is a very pervasive theme. For example, this is how uh, people describe um, how plant community changes after disturbance has wiped out uh, a site. So at the beginning, we usually have um, faster growing grasses colonizing the, the site that, uh, that uh, later are replaced by slower growing bushes and trees. And this is also true for other communities, for example, corals following disturbance, we see these uh, consistent changes in the distribution of fast and slow growers. So, uh, Growth is also an important, uh, I would say, parameter for uh, bacterial life. Uh, so for example, in many studies of marine bacteria, we see the distinction between fast growing copiotrophs that are usually found when nutrients are abundant and slow growing oligotrophs that instead are found where nutrients are scarce. 
So the question that I have, and uh, I would say the subject of the talk today is whether this trait, so growth rate, is important in other contexts. For example, when we have changes in temperature, changes in, changes in salinity. Um, so the plan for today is basically show you how we can use peruvite aquaculture experiments to study communities as the environment changes. And then I will show you that uh, we can use these, the results generated in these simple experiments to uh, generate hypotheses on how, um, let's say, uh, environmental drivers drive uh, community composition. And specifically, we show you that slower growers uh, bacteria are more abundant where and when temperatures are higher in the ocean. And finally, I will also show you that faster growers uh, are favored by increasing salinity in marine microcosms. All right, so just I work a lot in the lab. And one thing that we, that we do a lot is competing species in certain environments. And uh, it, to do so, we use these daily dilution experiments in which we uh, grow two species together. And then every day uh, we uh, take a bit of the previous day of, uh, of the previous day uh, culture and we uh, transfer into fresh media. Using these experiments allows us to see when uh, these communities reach stable states. But also we can do it at different, in different environmental conditions. For example, my um, colleagues, Claire and Simon, did these daily dilution experiments with several uh, species of bacteria at different temperatures. Uh, they did it at 16 degrees Celsius, 25 and 30 degrees. And what they saw is that um, as temperature was changing, also the outcome of the competition would vary. And specifically, they saw that, let's say, let's say this red and blue bug as an example, the red was winning at the lowest temperature. Then we had coexistence at the intermediate temperature. And finally, the blue bug would win at the highest temperature. Then what they did was actually measure growth rates of these different species individually at each temperature. And what they found is that um, across these different temperatures, the, the red bug was always the faster grower. And actually the, the, the gap in growth rates, uh, in maximum growth rate between these two species was increasing as temperature was increasing. But this also means that what they saw is that as temperature was increasing, the slower growing species was increasingly favored because at 25, they started coexisting. And finally, at 30, the blue bug actually outcompeted the red bug. Um, and the thing is that maybe you can say, OK, maybe it's just one pair. But actually, they did it for, I believe, 32 pairs. And they saw the same results. So basically, that increase in temperature favors lower growers. So, but when I saw these results, actually what came to my mind was, well, can we see this pattern in natural communities? For example, in the oceans where we have these um, great, let's say, changes in temperature so along uh, uh, environmental gradients. And so we started this project with uh, Clara Breu. She was a PhD student in the Gore Lab, and now she's uh, a postdoc uh, at Stanford with Dimitri Petrov. And so we, dis and we started this project with this very clear hypothesis in mind. If we are in the ocean and our predictions based on these simple experiments is true, we should see slower growing taxa uh, be more abundant at the summer if we are in the bottom hemisphere, at the equator, and at the surface of the ocean. So with this idea in mind, we started looking for uh, different data sets that would report changes in uh, marine in the composition of marine bacterial communities across seasons, latitude, and depth. So in the paper, we actually have seven data sets, but today I'm going to show you the results of uh, uh, the main three one. So, and this is a map showing you the location of these different data sets. So here, the first one is this amazing time series collected in the Baltic Sea at the uh, Linnaeus uh, Observatory. And um, this time series is about eight years. So the data that we had, but it's actually continuing. And it's at the very, um, uh, so the, quiz, the frequency is very high. Uh, so communities are actually sampled every two weeks or every month, depending on which year. And um, so along these data sets, clearly temperature is varying, is varying across time. So we have a, a strong seasonality. 
Uh, then we collect this data set that is a transect spanning more than 100 degrees of latitude across the Atlantic. So you can see that it starts here off the coast of um, uh, Patagonia and it arrives basically uh, in the, uh, close, to, close to Europe and the UK. Um, and finally, we uh, collected this, this other data set that is the Tara Ocean data set. Tara Ocean is an expedition that uh, has been going around for several years and is sampling marine communities, uh, not just bacteria actually, at very different stations uh, uh, along the globe. But also the thing that was really attractive to us is that they sample also at different depths. So uh, these dots actually reflect the multiple sampling along the water column from the surface to 1,000 meters of depth. So we collected the data set, but then the problem is we want to characterize the distribution of fast and slow growers, but we can't go to the lab and measure the growth rates. So, but actually the good thing is that we can use some genomic features of uh, bacteria that uh, can help us understand a bit the distribution of fast and slow grower. Specifically, uh, we found that, uh, uh, let's say, um, in 2016, there was this paper that uh, analyzed the growth rates of several bacteria species in the lab, and they showed that the maximum growth rate is positively correlated with the number of copies of the 16S RNA gene operon. So basically what this is telling us is that if the red bug, for example, has three or four copies of the 16S gene operon, is potentially a faster grower than a species like the blue bug that maybe has only one copy. But it also means that if we have a community, we can take the mean of the copy number weighted by the abundance of each species. And this simple number is describing uh, the abundance distribution of fast and slow growers. For example, a community that has more abundant, uh, faster growers, uh, proportionally, we have a copy number that is higher compared to a community that has more abundant, slower growers. So with this tool in mind, uh, in our hands, and uh, the data that we collected, we calculated for each community, for each sampling station or sampling time, uh, the, mean the, the mean copy number, and we correlated it with temperature. And these are the results. So for starters, in these plots, what you're seeing is how temperatures varies uh, uh, in these different data sets. So nothing very surprisingly, because for example, here in the uh, Baltic uh, station in the time series, we see that temperature is higher in summer and lower in winter. So all good. Uh, then in, this, uh, in, the, in the Atlantic data set, we can see that uh, again, uh, temperature is higher uh, at the level uh, in the tropics and the equator. And finally, uh, in the Tara Ocean, this is a slice of the data between zero and 40 degrees south, where we have the highest coverage in terms of uh, uh, depth measurements. We can see that as pre let's say, as expected, the temperature is higher at the surface and then declines as we go down the water column. Now, I will add to these plots the values of the copy numbers, uh, of the mean copy number for each community. And you can see that across these three data sets, uh, the mean copy number has uh, consistently the smaller values in correspondence with the highest temperatures. And we can also plot uh, this relationship uh, in a different way. Uh, we can plot the copy number as a function of temperature in these three data sets, and we see that there is a negative relationship, which is telling us basically that as we predicted from our, let's say, experiments, um, slower growers are more abundant where and when temperatures are higher. So in this inset, there are the slopes of these relationships. Uh, and I want to just draw your attention of the, on the slopes because they are really similar. So when I saw when I saw it, I was like, this is kind of unbelievable because these three data sets are very different. So we are in completely different basins, like the Baltic Sea is basically a brackish place, while the, we have these very vast transects. But I would say this uh, the, the slope of the relationship, which indicates uh, uh, that slower growing are favored by increasing temperatures is prominent. Okay, so 
The other thing that you might tell me, however, based also on what I just told you, is that, well, it's not just temperature that is varying in these, uh, uh, in these data sets, uh, in these locations. So for example, this is data from the Baltic Sea. You can see that across uh, the year, uh, it's not just temperature that is varying, but also nutrients like the uh, dissolved organic carbon that shows a peak uh, during the summer or nitrates and uh, phosphates that are a bit higher during uh, winter. And also we have ammonium that instead is pretty flat throughout the year. So, but, so what, one possibility is that uh, it's not just temperature that is affecting the mean copy number, but could be something else. So one thing that we asked is, uh, is the effect of temperature consistently negative when we account for uh, the uh, effect of all these other variables on the mean copy number? So and to do this, we uh, perform some statistical analysis using generalized additive models. And here in this, uh, let's say, um, heat map, I'm showing, I'm showing the values of the parametric coefficient estimated with the generalized additive model uh, for each environmental predictor modify, uh, multiplied by the standard deviation of the predictor so that we can, the, the values become comparable. And here, warmer colors indicate positive effects and, uh, light and uh, colder color, colors indicate negative effects. And the asterisk stands for the statistical significance of the coefficient. And as you can see in these three data sets, the effect of temperature is negative and statistically significant, even though the effect of other variables, for example, uh, ammonium uh, in the uh, LMO data is, can be important. So what this analysis is telling us is that, again, even though some environmental factors may, may play, play a role, in uh, affecting the, the value of the copy number, still the, the effect of temperature is negative and statistically significant. And we can also see it in other two data sets. Here I'm adding a uh, time series in the Mediterranean Sea and uh, spot is a time series in the Pacific. Um, and here you can see that uh, there are other variables that are extremely important in uh, uh, affecting uh, how the mean copy number changes throughout uh, the years, but still the effect of temperature is negative and, and significant. All right, the last thing that I want to tell you about uh, uh, this is that um, we believe that the effect of temperature on the distribution of fast and slow growers is general. And here I have a couple of examples to uh, show you why we think this. So these maps show the distribution of uh, two of the most important uh, contributors uh, to uh, actually the production of oxygen and primary productivity in the oceans. And there are the two cyanobacteria, Prochorococcus and Synecococcus. That distribution is very well known. And uh, this, in this map, uh, you can see that Prochorococcus is generally more abundant uh, at the tropics and the equator why uh, Synecococcus, distri Synecococcus distribution extends towards more temperate uh, and colder regions. So from experimental measurements of growth rates of Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus, Prochlorococcus is consistently a slower grower compared to Synecococcus. And so our prediction of the slower growing being more abundant in the, uh, when temperature is higher is actually in agreement with the distribution of pro and sin. The other thing, we're, and here we're changing system, we're going to soils. Um, uh, in the Harvard forest, scientists have been warming plots of soils for 20 years, and then they, they, they can measure their, the, the composition of these communities. And what they show is that basically after 20 years of warming, uh, the warm communities show a reduction in the mean copy number compared to the uh, control that has not been warmed. And, and again, this is uh, consistent with, with our predictions. All right, now I've been telling you about these lower growers being favored by temperatures, but maybe what you what you need, what you're asking yourself, or I hope you're asking yourself is, why is temperature favoring slower growers? And so we approach this question using uh, a modeling approach. And, um, and for this purpose, we're going back to two, two species of bacteria. 
And uh, we can write down the simplest model to try to understand why uh, uh, these lower growers are favored by, uh, by temperature. And we can go to the log Cavalterra model. So here I'm uh, showing you the equation for uh, one of the two species, the slow grower, and the per, the per capita growth rate um, is depending on the maximum growth rate of the slower grower. Then there is a self-inhibition term, a, the inhibition uh, by the faster grower uh, that multiplies the population of the fastest grower. And then we have this uh, mortality term that basically is introduced in the model to um, mimic what we're doing uh, in these daily dilution experiments. So since every day we are diluting by a bit, we are basically killing uh, systematically a, a portion of the population. And this is basically, is, and this mortality is basically fixed and constant uh, throughout the cycles. So, but, so if we do some reparam, reparam, re, sorry, reparameterization of the model, we can actually write it uh, in a way that mortality is absorbed, so that uh, basically the equation looks the same as the usual lot cavalterra model. But the important thing is that actually, when we look at the, uh, the formula for the inhibition coefficients, we can see that, um, for example, here, this is the inhibition of the slow, of the slow grower by the faster grower. Uh, it depends on the ratio between mortality and growth rates. And keep it in mind for a second. Um, so here, since we're back with the normal uh, lotka volterra model equation, it means that we can interpret the results of the lotka volterra model or predict the outcome of the competition just based on the values of the uh, inhibition coefficients. So here I'm plotting, uh, let's say, a phase space where the, um, on the uh, x-axis we have the logarithm of the inhibition of the slow by the fast grower, and on the y-axis the inhibition of the fast grower by the slow grower, always in logarithm. And what I was telling you before is that if both coefficients are uh, smaller than one, we can expect coexistence between these the two species. Uh, we can see bistability when we have bistability when both coefficients are larger than one. And bistability means that um, the outcome of the competition depends on the initial fraction of the two species. And then we can have in these two quadrants either the faster grower winning or the slower grower winning, depending on again the value of, of the coefficients. Now, what we can do in this model is allowing growth rates to be a function of temperature. And we can do this in different ways, meaning using different models. The simplest thing that one can use is the Arrhenius model, where the growth rate, this is again the growth rate of the slow grower, is uh, depends a bit on the activation, uh, depends on the activation energy, the Boltzmann constant, and the temperature in Kelvin. And um, this, this R here represents the uh, this constant, it represents a 16S copy number of the slower grower. So what we can see is that, uh, for example, if this R is one for the slower grower and three for the faster grower, we can, the Arrhenius model reproduces what we saw in the experiment that uh, across a range of temperatures, the uh, slower grower is consistently slower than the faster grower. So, so we see how, temp how growth rates vary with, te with temperature. Now we can go back to this phase space. So let's say in the experiment at the lowest temperature, we are starting with the faster growing winning. Any increase in growth rate that we can um, achieve by increasing temperature will allow us to shift uh, through an area of coexistence and finally to the slower growing winning. And this is because of this relationship. So basically as we increase uh, temperature, we're, in, we're increasing both growth rates and we can say that the inhibition of the fast grower, uh, of the slow grower by the fast grower decreases, and vice versa, the inhibition of um, the fast grower by the slow grower is increasing. So in this way, uh, so this model basically is predicting that as we increase temperature uh, and as we increase growth rates, we can grow from we can go from the faster growing winning to the slower growing winning the competition. Um, okay, the other thing is that. Uh, 
this is just two species, but we can generalize the, this lockable terra model to 100 species. Uh, and, can I interrupt uh, you for a second? We have a question yes. from, the, from the audience. Yes. So, Binayak, if I pronounce it correctly, is asking, what is the activation energy in this context? Uh, in this context, so it mean in the growth rate of bacteria, is the amount of basically of energy that allows you to start replicating. And uh, so you can make the analogy between, so the, um, so there are several papers showing that uh, the Arrhenius model is uh, a good way to, uh, to approximate uh, the, the exponential phase of the growth rate of uh, uh, bacteria, which is analogous basically to uh, the a chemical reaction. And in this, in our case, the, uh, the activation energy of the two species, I think they were the same, but then we, for example, in the paper, we try to vary the activation energy and energies and it doesn't affect that much the outcome of the competition. Um, yeah, I think that's the answer. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, but thank you for the question. Um, so. Uh, sorry, Martina. Can, can you go back a slide, please? Yes, I can do that, of course. Just for a second. So the um the interaction coefficient you call it here is uh alpha the uh, effect of the fast grow on the uh on the slow grow, right? Yeah. Right, okay. Cool. Thank you, Martina. Okay, no problem. Um all right. Um okay, what I was saying, yes, that we can extend this uh model to a hundred species. We have basically the same structure. We keep this mortality term, which um, in the, here we're trying to interpret the results of the uh, of the real communities in the ocean. And so we kept the mortality term because even in the ocean, uh, it has been estimated that uh, there is a lot of mortality that is uh, due to uh, viral uh, viral predation, grazing, and also wash the the, the action of wash of uh, bacteria being washed away by currents. And so we kept this delta. And uh, again, growth rates are a function of temperature with the same formula as before with the Arrhenius model. And again, we have this R that rep represents the copy number of the species. In this case, the uh, copy number of the species, we fish it from a geometric distribution with the P of the geometric distribution representing the um, most abundant copy number values in the ocean, which is actually close to one. Um, and we can see that we can run the simulations of this model and we can calculate a mean copy number of the communities after they stabilize. And we can plot it as a function of temperature. And we can see that this generalized lockable terra model recapitulates what we saw in the data, that the mean copy number decreases with temperature, indicating again that the slower growers are favored by increases in temperature. Last thing that I want to tell you about this is that uh, we can use the GLV, which is again, an extremely simple model with, with no assumption on how species are interacting to fit the data. And the fit to me was the most surprising thing of all because you can see the, so the, the, the color dots represent the uh, actual data and the black lines are the fit with the GLV. And they're pretty faithful. The, 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 the fit is pretty faithful to the data. And given that we're talking about natural data that are usually really noisy, I think this was kind of mind blowing for me. Uh, the other thing that I want to, again, draw your attention to are the slopes. The hollow tri triangles are the uh, observed slopes and the um, full circles are the fitted slopes, which again, there is very good agreement. So, Basically, to fit the GLV to the data, we only need one parameter. And this parameter is the P of the geometric distribution. So if we fit the P for each data set, then we, can, we, we are able to obtain this amazing fit of the GLV to the data. And just to, I want this, in these plots in the, uh, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, how uh, the agreement between the observed distribution of copy number in, in each data set, the color bars, and the fitted, and the fitted data, so the distribution of uh, the di abundance distribution of the copy numbers at the end of the simulations. 
And I think there is decent agreement between this fitted data and the observed data. Okay, so in the, in the last few things that I want to, few slides that I have, are basically responding to this other question. Well, we're doing great with temperature. Can we predict uh, the effect of salinity as well? And this is because basically salinity, we know that is, in, is another parameter that can affect growth. Uh, and also that uh, is one of the uh, actual um, variables that can really affect the distribution of bacteria across the globe. So just to, let's go back again to this uh, infamous slide that I showed you before. So we can still, and here I'm, I still have the equation that I showed you before with the um, inhibition coefficient being a function of this ratio between mortality and growth rates. So let's say that we are in the quadrant where the slower growing is winning. So we are at a decently warm temperature. Um, the slow growing is thriving. Uh, I think that based on what I showed you before is that we can expect that if we have a decrease in growth rates, we can go back to the quadrant or to the condition in which the fast growing is winning. So why I'm bringing this up? Because salinity uh, past the optimum, higher salinity are associated with slower growth rates. So here I'm showing you some data that we collected using uh, some marine isolates that we got from different, uh, from different marine locations. So here you see, so on um, each plot represents a genus and each line represents a species belonging or a strain belonging to this genus. And you can see that basically, even though there are some variation, um, growth rates increase very sharply. So you need a bit of salt to thrive for osmotic reasons if you are a bacterium. And then, but past this optimum, it's really, temp, uh, sorry, uh, growth rates start to decrease very sharply. So our hypothesis is that um, if we see across a, a gradient of salinities, as we increase salinity, we would see faster growing species being favored. Okay, so in this case, and this is work in progress with uh, Jana Husman, who is a postdoc in the Gore Lab. And um, so we, we took a slightly different approach. Uh, so we started from um, experiments with marine communities. So last, no, this year, last year, we went around the coast of Boston and we started collecting water samples. And we got one um, from uh, the Charles River, which is, which is a freshwater environment. Then we got other samples from this area here that is a more brackish. And finally, we took a trip to Nahant, which is a very nice location near Boston that has a very lovely beach. And, um, and we collected some water here. It was very cold, so it was not such a pleasant experience, but anyway. So let's say um, we got our water samples, then we went back to the lab and we uh, concentrated the, um, uh, the water in order to obtain a bacterial suspension with a decent, de a decent uh, density of bacteria. And we, and we, we inoculated into a marine broth that had uh, with different salinities, specifically a salinity of 16, 31, and 46 grams per liter. And uh, we followed also in this case a daily dilution protocol and in this case, we were diluting uh, uh, every 48 hours, just because we were afraid marine bugs can be a, bit of, a little bit slower compared to other species. Um, so we did this protocol for about a, uh, six cycles. And uh, at the end of the six cycles, we performed 16 s amplicon sequencing. So we obtained uh, the composition of these communities. And then we could calculate for each of these communities the mean copy number, as I showed you before. Okay, now I'm showing you these are pre our preliminary results. And um, on the y axis, we have the mean copy number, and on the x axis, salinity as grams per liter. And you can see that as we increase salinity, we, so we see also an increase in the mean copy number, indicating that uh, com uh, communities. Uh, uh, display more abundant, faster growers at the highest salinity. But since we are in the lab, we can also do something else. Specifically, at the end of each, so 
at the end of each dilution uh, of the dilution cycles, so after these six cycles, we can plate and we try if we can try to isolate the community members, and uh, we can calculate their maximum growth rate at these different conditions. So we can we can individually grow these uh, uh, different bacteria and uh, measure their growth rates at 16, 31, and 46 grams per liter of salt. And with this, uh, instead of using this genomic proxy, we can actually calculate a mean growth, uh, mean, gro mean community growth rate. And this is what we're currently doing. We're still in the process of collecting uh, um, these growth rate curves. We are currently, uh, we isolated uh, many, many species and we are currently measuring their growth rate. So this is a preliminary plot showing you that when we use this uh, maximum growth rate at each condition to calculate this mean growth rate of the community, we see basically the same result, that as we increase salinity, we increase the proportion of faster growing species. Okay, so what I hope to what I hope that I convinced you of today is that um, so the um, mean the mean copy number is a good indicator uh, for uh, uh, studying the composition of communities that gives an idea of the distribution of fast and slow growers. And using this indicator, we've been able to show that. I would say that slow growers thrive when the environment is more benign, meaning like a warmer temperature and perhaps uh, uh, less salt. Um, the other thing uh, that I showed you or, uh, is that the effects of temperature and salinity on growth rates, so physiological effects, can really scale up, scale up to determine community structure. And But actually, it's not, we, just, we don't just need the, um, physiological information, because we need, for example, we need models to actually predict how community structure changes as the environment change. And I think I showed you today that the Locke Volterra model is a good, simple model to make some of these predictions. All right, so with this, I'd like to thank my co-authors. Uh, so Jeff, uh, my PI for the past uh, many years, uh, Claire, Karina, and Yaron, who are my co-authors in the temperature paper, and Jana, who is uh, 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 the postdoc I'm collaborating with in this salinity project, the rest of the Gore Lab, and my funding sources. And three seconds of self-promotion, as Marco told you before, I'm opening my lab, and uh, I am currently in the search for postdocs. So if you are interested in working with microbial communities, and the kind of flavor of experiments, uh, theory, and uh, data analysis that uh, I showed you might appeal to you, please uh, uh, contact me. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to me. And I'm happy to take any question. Thank you, Martina, for a very, very nice talk.